Welcome to The Second Studio, a design and architecture podcast hosted by two architects, myself, David Lee, and Marina Bordarone. This week, it's just the two of us, and we are talking about what? The design process. The design process, right? Why are we talking about the design process? Because you'd love to talk about it. <laughs> Because a few months ago, we did a recording on design concepts, developing a concept for a design, and that recording seemed to have struck a chord with a number of listeners, I think perhaps because the idea of a concept is more elusive. So this is a follow-up sort of to that recording, and also we did a presentation to a school on design process ease, which resulted in um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Slightly reformatted, a little bit different. Right? Sounds like you're just recycling materials here. Director's cut. <laughs> the Snyder cut. <laughs> okay. okay. So the design process. Right. I think this is a good thing to talk about also because it tends to be somewhat mysterious for a lot of designers and non-designers. Right. The question is, like, what is the process you go through in school? Are you taught a certain thing? Is that how do all architects approach designing buildings and open spaces and whatever else the same way? Is there a one, two, three, four, five that I'm just meant to be going through? Right. Right. I mean, do you think there's a one, two? I guess we'll find out. I mean, I think you know, s school probably teaches you some like key steps that you should be looking at to to develop your design and therefore become somehow your design process. Once you're out of school, th there is many different design processes. It really depends on the individual, it depends on the project, it depends on your experience. So there is not like one universal way that every designer can can design something, mm -hmm. design a building. And in that sense, that's not so much what this recording is about. Like it's not gonna be like step one, step two, step three, here you go, now you have a design. Like it's not so much that, it's more big picture. Yeah, and I think we'll discuss why the step-by-step -step approach is not a good one. Um, okay, so to start, I think we have to have a base understanding of what design is. And this, of course, ties directly back into the concept recording we did, which if you are remotely interested in any of these topics, you should listen to that one paired with this one. Um, so in that recording, we talk about design as being uh, basically problem solving, right? And if we accept that as being the case, then um, another way to think about design is as a math problem of sorts. I mean, it's different, it's more creative in a certain sense, but it's a math problem. So in a math problem, you have certain givens, the 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 information that's given to you, and then your job is to work with that within that information to figure out a solution, right? And so design in a way is also all about understanding the given variables that you have, right? And a project that would include obvious things like the program, the function of the building, let's say the site of the building, the client, that's actually a really big one. Um, and I think that's something that many architects and designers kind of like jump over, right? And in a sense that understanding the client is just as important as understanding the site, right? So if we value understanding the location of the projects and all those things, then the understanding of the client has to be equally as valued. And we have to spend just as much time thinking about that problem in the design process. Um, but that has more to do with like people skills, which I think we're going to cover in a different recording. Um, so what happens is that when you are doing, when you are gathering this information, right, this information is actually developing for you a kind of rough outline, a murky image of what the solution is going to be, right? It, it's not clear, obviously, because it's not the final solution yet, very far from that. But it's giving you, again, the field that you're playing within and an understanding of it, right? And that also means that when you come to design something, you're never designing in a void. There's never, there's always something to work with, which actually makes, in some ways, the design process easier. It's really difficult to design with no reference to anything on a true blank page, right? Really difficult to do that and also not realistic. So by accepting the fact that we have to understand the information that's given to us, that we have to research that information, that can actually get you a long ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. At the same time, this, this is not to say that the information you are studying is going to directly give you a solution or prescribe a solution. I think in projects that seem 
And projects that seem like way too practical in a sense, it's because they just took what was given to them and then made a project from it when they didn't question the information that was given to them. Does that sort of also make sense? Yeah, or like when the project feels like it's kind of soulless, you yeah. know, when it's like, okay, yeah, here is a building, there is doors, there is windows, there is everything I had on my list, but there isn't the it. And I think this is also the difference between the what and the why, which I think we'll get into, but this is like a lot of times when you talk to, um, when you're given a program or you talk to a client, right, you ask them, okay, what is the problem that we're dealing with? And they don't give you the actual problem. They just give you like the what, which is, uh, so in the case of a school, so what's the problem? Like, why do you want to do school? Well, we need, you know, 23 classrooms and we need X amount of playground space and breakout rooms for the faculty and whatever, whatever. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of the question um, uh, because that's just, that's the program. That's like the scope. That's, that's the, what the what stuff. That's not why. That's very different from saying, well, we're making a new school because we feel it's our job to teach, let's say, an elementary school, young students about life, and we don't feel like the building is conducive to that. Well, that is much more fundamental and much more interesting. So the information I was talking about before, the givens and the variables, could be categorized more as like the what factors. It's just the stuff, right? Right. Um, another way to think about it is that these things are just ingredients right they don't actually like ingredients in a recipe their ingredients don't tell you what to do or why you should be doing so it doesn't give you direction at all it's just in front of you and uh it would be a terrible way to i assume bake a pie by taking ingredients and then just kind of <laughs> putting the ingredients on a plate and being like look here's the pie <laughs> right there's another process that has to happen of of manipulating the ingredients and mixing them together and understanding what, what the direction is. Why are you smiling? And that's at me? that's being that's that's said by someone who makes pie very often <laughs> that knows the process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's not how I cook. My my, me my method is more like um, yeah, take I mean, out <laughs> buy the pesto pasta and then heat up the pesto pasta. <laughs> okay, that's why I'm not a chef. Um, okay, but that's like yeah. that's more almost like research. In that sense, right? It's like, yeah, it's it's what are you what are you given? But obviously, you don't design that way. Otherwise, otherwise, anyone could design. Anyone that's rational could design, right? Yes, that that's actually a really really good point. I know. Um, that's a really good point because I think this gets to another question that my clients have, which is, they will say, "I I already know what I want, right? I just need someone to draw it for me." I know. <laughs> Uh, like who posted Andy Bernheimer or some architect that I follow on Instagram posted like a screenshot of an email from a client who said, you know, dear sir, madam, like I, or dear sir, I need like an architect, whatever, whatever I do. You were recommended, um, yada, yada. Last sentence said, but I already know what I want anyway, uh, sincerely, et cetera. And it's like, well, if you already know what you want, then don't bother hiring an architect. Also, that's a terrible way to understand, again, the problem yeah. going back, like most clients and most people and even designers, they confuse the what and the why, right? Well, I fulfilled the program, right? The school has, I gave you 23 classrooms and et cetera, et cetera, right? And I also made it sustainable, right? But that's not addressing the core problem at hand, you know, the core motivation. Um, the other the other train of thought, I think, or the debate in design process is when you come to a project, Right. Um, so in a way, what I'm saying is that the design comes out of an understanding of the information. Right. Now, the the other side of this conversation is that, well, as as an artist, as a designer, as a human being with my own backgrounds, I don't come to the projects like fully naked. Right. There's some kind of inherent interest that I have that I bring to the project. And so it's a question, like, should it be entirely about the project information or should it be more about myself and my expression, right? And my journey as, as a designer or some kind of combination thereof? And the answer is that it's the combination of thereof. You, you, can't, you can't say that you're coming to a project fully naked. It's impossible. You're a human being. You're not a robot. Um, you're not a computer, uh, you know, scripting program. And you also can't come to the project and declare that it's all about your hand and your magnificent artistic formal sketches and things like this. Uh, and when you do that, then you cease to be a good architect. 
scary. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and that's uh, the, maybe the difference between you know an artist and an architect, where right? yeah. you have responsibility to the client through the project, an artist not so much. And then on the other side of the spectrum, something that a response that is very impersonal might be more like a corporate aspect to a, a design and a design process, right? When something are done and they're kind of like too plain yeah. and too, you, you don't feel like there was someone behind it, someone who designed it or, or thought about it. it. It does feel like a little bit, you know, maybe corporate. Yeah. So I, I think also in, in the concept of recording, we talk about research and thinking about it as a, a journalist or a detective, as you called it, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to go over that again here. Because... Perry Mason mission. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, but I think that's the right mindset to have. So I, I don't want to go on that too much. But it is important to mention that the research part of the design process is is in some way a standalone portion. Like you can you can clearly say I'm doing research as opposed to producing design. And and kind of like that's true. Like on paper, that's absolutely true. But internally, I think as a designer, you can't think that way. Because if you think that you are doing research now and I'm not designing, and then later on, later on I'm gonna design, you're probably bringing the wrong mental approach to the research, right? Like we have a tendency to think that design is the act of drawing and creating something, right? Which that's part of it. But design is also research. That's fundamental to the process. But it, but it, but it's a mindset thing, right? You can't approach research saying I'm uh, th because we also tend to think that the design portion of drawing and creating is the creative portion, the conceptual portion, and we limit those words creative and concept conceptual to that area where we are actually drawing or modeling things. No, that's false. The researching is just as creative as, and as conceptual if you do it correctly. So you're saying like instead of just looking at maybe, I don't know, data of, uh, I don't know, like age population in that neighborhood to develop my project or like the size of the streets nearby mm -hmm. or like, like bare data, data uh, type of research, Maybe there is more of a problematization that needs to happen in your head and, and you to think like, what data do I want to be looking at? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a data that you would not have thought about at first because it doesn't seem like it necessarily relates to a physical building, but it might lead your research and your design process down to a very interesting approach. Yes, absolutely. There's two analogies to this. The first that I thought of is that when it comes to being a good boss or employer or a good teacher, we tend to think that teaching is all about talking, right? Because I'm, I'm taking action, right? I think there's an idea of action and inaction that's also very parallel. I'm taking action, I'm talking, I'm teaching. No, that's, that's half of teaching at most. The first half of teaching and the most important half is just listening to what the students have to say. If it's not a lecture-based course, obviously, if it's a studio course. The other analogy is, um, well, going back to chefs, right? Like. There, there are these um, cooks or chefs or I don't know what are you, pastry artists, and I don't know what you call them, where they go out and forge and they find their own ingredients. Would any of those chefs say that my cooking process is limited to only when I have, only when I'm in the kitchen assembling stuff? No, their process starts during the foraging phase. It starts for the, during the research of the ingredients, finding the ingredients and understanding what their value is, right? And they're thinking creatively when they're out in the forest in Denmark or whatever the fuck they're doing, right? They're thinking creatively out there of how this, how this has potential to be mixed with other things. What does this mean for the recipe I'm trying to create or for the problem I'm trying to solve? The same exact thing, right? Um, I think that's a good example, actually. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good example. <laughs> so and the, the, the thing, yeah, the, the process is not just when you think you're working on it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also like when you're moving around and like you say, you're thinking about your project, but you are not necessarily at a desk doing diagrams and things. It's, it's a little more blurry than that. It's much more blurry and it starts from the very beginning before you even, start, as soon as you begin the research, or as soon as someone tells you what the program is, those wheels are turning. And sometimes I feel like some, you know, sometimes 
the way to start the research is just go about like the, the the known given the things the first thing that will come to mind right but the other way to maybe undercover undiscover um the things that you're truly unconsciously interested by the project or the site is also some a, a, a way to start the research say that again like let's say I don't know you have this building and for some reason there is something in the site and and the client that really interests you but you you can't really figure it out and then you figure out one day that it's because it's surrounded by bakeries and that's why you're actually truly interested in this project right well that's also another way to drive your research not only by like you know I don't know massing access and light and shadow and mm-hmm. stuff like that but it could also be about the thing that excites you about the project yes you know because sometimes it's it's it is there it's already present right and you just need to kind of uncover it and and reveal it and explore it yeah yeah I I, I agree I think it's this I think uh, or like you know you know you go to the site you do your research you take photos measurements you know, like there is something that makes this space magical you know and it's not on any map it's not something the client mentioned I, I just I feel it by being in this particular spot under this tree that this is a magic thing yeah. you know there, you know so it's just to say that there is the data research and then there is maybe the more sensible research mm-hmm. that is also not to forget sensitive sensorial sensitive sensorial yeah. like <clears throat> like human feeling things that are not necessarily things that are in the books or on maps yes yes I, th- I think I think that's a good delineation and I think it's true I think that people who tend to be too reliant on the data side of things their designs end up being very dry and inhuman right and very there's like a lot of distance between the uh, the the human nature and then the design itself and then on the other hand people who lean way too much into their own awarenesses the project just becomes kind of irrelevant to a lot of the actual factors at play but so despite the the importance of the information that's separate from you I think also design is about understanding your being aware of your own intuitions mm-hmm. and acknowledging I have these intuitions and knowing what they are it's okay first you have to allow yourself to have intuition then second you have to express that in some way and then third you have to try and figure out why you feel this way about something and I know for myself in my own process that's a lot of it and it's it's and an intuition is is we could do a whole conversation about where that comes from but a lot of times the intuition that I have or other designers have in their own work um, is for some kind of legitimate reason right uh, for a reason at least a lot of times it's legitimate it's because uh, based on <laughs> past experiences something in your subconscious is telling you like you know don't go don't, don't go that way right and you go down a dark alley this doesn't feel right this doesn't feel good go this direction instead um, and other times there are intuitions that you have which feel valid to you but you end up recognizing well this is just because of of my own experiences which are in direct conflict with what the problem at hand is so I can't allow that to take over too much or inform too much but that's why like the whole research portion you know has to be done at a desk on a computer with pens and trace and 3d model physical model but you also have to be a, a physical exploration of where is the building going to take, take place like you gotta physically go and experience and understand hmm. and observe and 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 do detective work and you know like well that's an yeah you know I mean you know technically we could design things remotely right we just need to have the data given to us a couple of photos of I don't know a home remodel right a wish list from a client and then like we can come up with ideas is it going to be a good idea? It's probably going to work. Is it going to be the best one? No, because you won't be able to experience what the home feels like, what the client feels like as a person, right? Yeah, I think that's also interesting because the idea of visiting the site is something that we dis- we talk about in the profession a lot. You know, you yeah. can gain so much by visiting the site, and I think that's true. I do think though that it's a it's um is a it is a skill set to go to a 
an actual real life physical place and then to absorb that information that's there and be able to decipher it, right? Because a lot of times the actual physical environment, there's a lot of stuff going on. Well, and, it doesn't, lot of, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't mean like it's good and that the design necessarily needs to be based on that. Yes, right? correct. Like, let's say around your lot is just a bunch of very ugly, dilapidated building. Well, that might not really tell you like, you know, much about what your building needs to be, but you got to know that that's the way they are. You can also put something that's completely out of whack and like way out there if that's what's next to it, you know, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think that's also why there's the balancing, uh, in this case, the balance between what you feel at the site versus what more objectively that information means on paper in the context of everything else, all the other information that you've found or has been given to you, right? Um, to kind of like level it to put in the same plane to understand like actually the hierarchy between it i think there's I, I think yeah going to a site can actually be very dangerous for a lot of designers because they don't understand how to again absorb and and transcribe that information and it's overwhelming there's too much there's too much being input there's too much being absorbed right i mean there's like the weather the sky there's the sun there's there's all these factors there there's the details of whatever debris there's the material there's like a lot of stuff yeah i mean it's easier to just you know keep your nose on your screen and and make up something right? <laughs> that's true that's true you have um, to deal with real, real shit <laughs> so in the beginning we said that the design process in our view doesn't is not a step-by-step -step thing but that doesn't that's not that but that doesn't mean that there is not a sense of direction in the design process um now uh, so there is direction and uh, there is direction for some fundamental reasons the first is that we are trying to complete something we're creating something that has not existed before therefore there's a deadline and there's a sense of direction toward that calendar deadline and also a sense of direction toward the completion of this object the other reason why there's a direction is that the so you mean by direction you mean progress uh so let's say a, a, a project takes like i don't know three months to design or something like this right um just because there's not a clear step-by-step -step approach to it, right? It does not mean that you're just swimming in circles and spinning and going around in whatever direction until now you're done and now it's complete, right? Like there should be a sense, yes, of progress. There's, um, it's like a pyramid shape, right? But maybe a little bit less linear. Like the, 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 the design process line, I might've said this before, is not a, boop 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 done it's not all it's and it's, it's also not like a bunch of squiggles until the deadline's here now i'm finished right there should be movement in a direction but getting there might not be super linear okay i don't know it's kind of abstract be, because again we're completing we're creating something and the other reason is that we are looking for conceptual clarity in the thing that we're creating so we're looking, in a sense, uh, we're looking for physical clarity from nothing to something, and we're looking for conceptual clarity, again, from nothing to eventually a very clear uh, concept statement, which is executed through the building, right? So again, the variables at the beginning, that information gives you the murky image, right? And the kind of some things to be revealed, and eventually that image will become clear. So therefore, there's a sense of direction, despite there not being a color by the numbers uh, approach. Makes sense? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, and I, I, the reason why I say that also is that I think that the people who tend to follow the same exact step-by-step -step process every time, their work ends up being very reductive and dry and boring. Because what happens is... Well, they probably lose interest too after the third one, you know? Well, they turn off their creative brain. Yeah. They're, well, right? they just, you just apply it as a, yeah, a recipe. A template. Yeah, a template. Yeah. Be so let's say, let's say you were taught, uh, okay, so learn the program, right? You're given the program, study the program, whatever. Uh, learn about the site, right? And then you do some uh, bubble diagrams. <laughs> This is what a lot of people are taught. You do bubble diagrams where you have the program, right, in circles, and you kind of move them around so that they are in the right kind of 
uh, yeah, we want to relationship and things as this, and then that's related to the site. Then you do some circulation diagrams and stuff, and then in that case, you are clearly moving from a a more abstract understanding to a more real, more real, more real. So let's say you take those bubble diagrams, and then they become it becomes like an outline of a floor plan, then a real floor plan, and then there's furniture involved. Then you bring it up in three D and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is a very prescriptive approach to design, and the problem with it is that. As you said, when you do it over and over and over again, there's a tendency to only think, to only problem solve for the step that you're in, right? So if I'm in the bubble diagram step, I'm only going to think about bubble diagram mindset for that. And once I'm done with that, I move on to the next thing. Let's say it's floor plans. Now I look at only floor plan mindset. And so at each phase, you're locking yourself in cre creatively, um, creatively to just one thing, one sliver of understanding of the project, right? And that's problematic because what you should be doing throughout the entire process is being open to all of the possibilities and all the different ways of understanding the design. Yeah, and I feel like that's a process that you find often in offices. And, you know, my guess is that, well, you need some sort of structure in mm -hmm. offices and also you need a way to explain to the client why you're charging them so much and where you started where you're going and and like you can't be still everything up in the air when you work with clients that's why you're going through these very defined steps right, right? because they need to see the progression as it, it's moving forward towards something yeah and i think also that's a good point because i don't because the, the, again roughly speaking roughly speaking the process does go from a murky image to a more clear image more clear 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 until it becomes like crystal clear at the very end right that is the direction and as far as clients are concerned that's the direction too because you can't be going backwards too much because it's going to like fuck up the schedule but internally i suppose as a designer you can't allow yourself to turn off thinking um when the steps you take become too fine grain when they become too specific so like in in like act in practical and in, in practice you have like conceptual design schematic design design development construction documentation etc like those i would not really fuss with too much like those are really you know broad scale rough those are really rough i uh steps in the process they're not even steps really they're like they're not even chapters they're like mini i don't know like one like season one season two season three season four in an in a in a in a uh, in a show right that's more the structure that that's providing as opposed to what is this exact scene going to be about in this one episode out of 20 in a season kind of thing does that make sense yeah i mean it's a it's a good it's a good point though like the scale um issue yeah and i mean that we're talking right now about the the very uh Fine grain. The, the very baby baby project in the design process like the very very first few pieces and things you're trying to assemble and now you're not that far along that's true also um you know we're not saying like oh you should like always like, keep everything open or you know even if you're like in dd or cds because that just doesn't make sense that you think that way at the very very beginning well, but 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 the difference between your mindset and how you're thinking versus what gets executed in that phase, and what I'm saying is that you sh you can have an extremely open mindset throughout, and knowing that it's going to be funneled down to the 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 project phase that you're in, but not letting the specific steps or even the phases dictate your thinking. Right. Does that make sense? Sort of. Okay, so I think the, the the issue that we're highlighting here is is perhaps the difference from let's say the client's perspective versus the designer's perspective, right? What I'm talking about it's internally as a designer when you're going through the process, you need to stay open and ever have a very broad the broadest view possible throughout the entire thing. Even when the project's done, you still need to maintain that view, right? Now, from the outsider's perspective, from the client's perspective, let's say there it does appear like there is not a step-by-step -step, but phase-by-phase process because there is because 
you need to complete things and it has to do with like you know confirming um um uh what do you call it uh check what do you call it checkpoints benchmarks or whatever right to get approval to move to the next thing that's more to do but see those things exist more to do from like external factors of getting paid of making sure that you can hold the client accountable to not change their mind later to to like these kinds of things right that and also you the client doesn't necessarily see or is aware of like the internal the internal and the struggles or the all of the things that you're considering because because that's that's what they're hiring you for to have to deal with that right 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 and actually i think that's also a good briefly as an aside that's also a good thing for us all to understand as to why there's sometimes this is there's an inherent kind of conflict or difference between as a client what i want and what i expect to happen versus what the designer can offer because the as a client i'm only seeing the process from the outside i'm only seeing what you show me and i have a certain understanding of it or a certain assumption of it right um so there's that the other thing that this highlights for me is that there there is there is maybe a difference between the the thinking and the research and the and the vision the broad vision versus the execution of the thing so like it is a mistake so let's say we're in construction documentation phase to get hyper specific right and we know what that's that phase is about now does it make sense for me to go backwards and start thinking about how this thing relates to the site when you're doing details right and you're working out construction issues on paper no that makes no sense like don't do that because what we like you know you're past it that part of the thinking is done don't think about that but what I'm saying is that you actually you actually always need to think about that one because even during CDs and even during CA there's going to invariably be design questions that come up but you can realize that there are questions that maybe could have been answered better or questions that weren't asked in the beginning and that could still somehow inform the design the only time it doesn't inform something is when it's basically built and complete then it's kind of like it's too, too late in the past but even then again internally from a designer's view you have to think about those things because how else are going to learn well then and, and for example in cds or ca when something needs to change from what was initially designed it's a way looking back it's a way to evaluate and validate or reject a change right right you want to make sure you stick to to the things that were discussed and and were agreed on in the directions you were going forward to. this is what i was saying before it's like it's it's about not letting the step or the phase or the what would appear to be the immediate problem in front of you you're not letting that dictate your thinking right that's backwards in a way so even in the very beginning in the researching like we were talking about like the mistake that a lot of designers make is that why would i research this this has nothing to do with what a school is or what with uh, has nothing to do with uh, whatever issue i'm thinking about right well you don't know that right and and that's the problem you turn off your thinking to those other things because you are now saying okay i'm for, i'm 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 clearly in this step of the phase i'm only doing bubble diagrams if i'm only doing detailing I'm only doing what pro the program was given to me false all false right and that's um, a really challenging part i think of the design process we're good on that should we move on yes uh ah right so this is actually the bulk of the recording now so that being said um after well, you kind of do research throughout, but let's say the initial research phase is kind of completed and you're now designing the object, the thing. What do you do? If there's not a step-by-step, <laughs> -step, like, what do I do? Well, so when we were talking about um, this issue, I think for the both of us, it basically is about producing something and then doing a series of tests on that thing to understand essentially whether or not it's good or bad, right? Um, and that's roughly the entire design process at different uh, focuses and different scales and, and different uh, lengths of time. But essentially, you create things, and during the creation of it, and after the creation of the thing, you try to understand where, why it's good or bad, and then you improve on it, or you revise it, you throw it out, you start over again. So the design process has actually 
understanding the design process and and being being able to design is really I think fund, fundamental to that is understanding how to know if something is good or bad. Um, so testing things is basically a way to solve two things. The first one is making sure that what we're designing is actually good and it fits the design, right? Otherwise, you know, we could just keep going on in details and then later on realize that it doesn't work. So that's that's that. The other thing is maybe sometimes you're stuck. You're stuck in, in the research and the design process and just testing different ideas or like questioning what you've been doing is a way to open new doors and reject some of those ideas. Uh, yes, designer's block. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, the other thing too is that on the face of it, the idea of testing would sound like, is this, is this the same thing as understanding how to be a good critic, like a design critic? And it is sort of, but not really, because I think the tests we're going to talk about are really meant to be used during the design process, as opposed to critiquing the thing in the end of whether or not it's good. Uh, but, but but testing is a way to... It's a, it's a way of... Criticizing. Criti but it is, in this case, criticizing to move forward in right, the design. Right. That's like has to be very clear. Like, um, I think a lot of criticisms I hear made by people who are not designers, they always have a different flavor to them because you can tell they don't really know how to give advice Let's say in the case of a midterm or in the middle of a project, right? How to give feedback that's going to move things forward. Right. It's like different. It's, it's easy to say whether or not something's good or bad. More difficult to say whether or not it's good or bad to move forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I mean, when you're designing, you know, buildings, um, you might be on your own designing it. Or you might have a client that, you know, could you could test the ideas through a client. That could be another way. But testing is a way to to basically step out of your role of designer, look at it on very specific uh, aspects, not just criticizing it as like, like you said, I, I like it or I don't like it, but like, okay, does this meet this aspect of the project? How does this relate to the site? How does this do that? Well, this one doesn't work, this one does. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are, what, five or six of these that we kind of came up with. The first one is uh, different forms of media. So uh, fortunately for us, unlike writers who, who are more or less limited to just writing, um, you know, as designers of things, we have a bunch of different ways to explore the object that we're dealing with. And uh, this is a very basic, simple thing. So if you're working, we have two-dimensional drawings. We have uh, three-dimensional stuff in, in the physical world or digital space. We have fucking writing, diagramming, speaking, talking to other people. I, I, th I think that it's pretty easy for a lot of designers to get stuck into one of these modes and to kind of like just keep beating the dead horse and to try and get as much out of it as possible. When in reality, they need to shift gears and move to a different uh, way of working, right? To, to break loose and to see it in a different way. Yeah, and sometimes I feel like, you know, like we kind of each have our own um, medium that we like to use or like we're better at. Like, yeah, I don't know, you're better at sketching, I'm better at 3D modeling, or he's better at writing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's easier to just start with the ones we're better at because we're more comfortable um, and, and we tend to feel good about it more quickly, which is another thing we can talk about later. But there is, like you said, a, a, a pretty big array of things that you can use, the tools that are available. So if you feel like you're not progressing, which really is super important in the design process, you got to switch gear and experiment even with a medium that you, you don't typically use. I mean, I think even in the broader scope, you see designers who too quickly limit themselves to one way of, to, to one medium, right? And they therefore their design suffers because they, they're missing a different perspective it suffers um, or you can tell and it becomes repetitive that's also too becomes repetitive uh, this is why actually you know a lot of times teachers will tell students like you got to draw this thing like you got to draw a floor plan of this thing or you have to model in 3d they're always telling you to do something different from what you've done because they know there's something else to be learned they actually probably know specifically exactly what the problem is and they want you to figure out and understand what the problem is by working through this other way. I mean, working elevation versus plan, they're very different things. And that's why that's why it's important to 
maybe you can have a favorite medium but really you should use them all mm -hmm. because i feel like there could be a tendency of kind of denying some of them or like deliberately not using some of them to make sure that the ideas that you want to be validated or tested right are which in that case to me it's a little um how do you call that like it's a little corrupted the design process Corrupt, you know yeah it's corrupted because you're 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 not really testing it objectively right you're testing it with a, an end goal that you've already set right 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 which hey hello like you're too far you're, you're too early on and that, that's not how you should be approaching the thing well that also reminds me that a, a, another uh, portion of the mindset discussion is that I think as human beings we're always looking for security and for answers right and it's and well, actually one of the fundamental traits of a designer is that you have to go against that and want to always be questioning question 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 and it sucks to do that because it means you never really know what the answer is and even if you know what the answer is you're still gonna question yourself <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a it's an infinite process um, but so that that lesson extends here in everything that you do and certainly it would apply to in what form that you're working if you're super super comfortable working in rhino doing 3d renderings and perspectives and these kinds of things right um you got to ask yourself do i not use other ways of 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 working other ways uh, to test right because i feel that this is the what i'm doing is the best way or is there some part of me that thinks that well this is just comfortable, in fact. Yeah, and you probably won't pass the, I don't know, uh, section test or <laughs> elevation test, you right. know? Plan test, more like. And, and you know, you can, I mean, you can lie to yourself and, and have biases and, and corrupt the design process, but ultimately it impacts the final result. Mm -hmm. And and people will be able to tell. They will be able to tell when they move in the building, like, okay, some, you know, they didn't think about that or... Yeah. The, there is a loose end here <laughs> that's not figured out a, a very common example that we've heard amongst many practitioners um and it applies to myself too and, and maybe it's a generational thing i don't know but a lot of times people will be working in the computer right typically in 3d or even not in 3d whatever in, in the computer and again they're working 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 and they have this problem they're trying to solve and they're they're just again beating a dead horse it's not not happening but they keep working the computer and then they step aside they pull out a piece of trace or their notebook and they do some sketches either freehand completely or maybe o overlaid on trace on top of a printout for like 10 minutes and then uh, they make a huge step in the design process why again because they're stepping outside of that being locked into one medium right and that 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 specific example is something we hear like by everyone, pretty much, kind of remarkable. Or, or like you, like you were saying, you could be maybe I don't know, very good at three D modeling, and you're drawn to creating those like blobby shapes that look really good, right? And then comes the time where you have to present that to some client or teacher, and express where does that come from? What does it mean? Like, what does it do? Why is it like this and not like that? And you've never put words on any of the things you've been working on, you know? That's yeah, are you anti blob or what? Hey man, I look. I, I like some good blobs, but you gotta <laughs> gotta control your you blobs. You gotta control your blobs. <laughs> well, I think that's also that's also actually you start to bring up another point, which is you don't want to you don't want to let the medium you're working with dictate too much the design. That's a bit. You could actually argue both ways on that, but. But there's something there and it's the same thing as what you said earlier with the 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 data of the research you can't right. let that lead everything right. it, it's at the end of the day it, it's a it's a happy marriage of many things but you know you gotta pick carefully what will dictate maybe the design it cannot be something for convenience or something because you're lazy or the first thing that jumps to mind like yeah. it, you know, it has to be a little bit more than that. So I think this first test is productive in the sense of uh, uh, producing probably better design, better architecture, and also allowing yourself to move forward and not feel super stressed out and going down again that that one frame of mind and getting stuck into it. The next test that I like to use quite often is a test of abstraction, um, which is to say that if you have this thing in front of you and you're trying to understand if it's good or bad or, or which direction you should go next, um, 
you basically make this thing more abstract than what it is. In the case of, let's say you're working on a floor plan, you do a diagram of the floor plan. Diagramming fits neatly into the abstraction test, and that's a big part big part of it, right? You, you're, you're removing a lot of the miscellaneous stuff to see the, the more pure, um, naked version of that thing to realize something about it. No, I think that's a good one. I think that's something that's used also like in the in the arts, right? As a way of composing, you know, in a composition, like you see the the stronger elements, the balance, where things are, how it flows, you know. Um, yeah, and and it's, that it's, could sometimes it's... even reveal the thing that might be the strongest in the design that you haven't even realized was. But by doing that, you kind of. It's like you're squinting your eyes a little bit, you yeah, know, yeah. to see a little clearer in what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say squinting your eyes, and 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 equally too, and this gets to another point, which I don't, is that um, you you make it more abstract, and you could also make it less abstract. It's kind of like a dial. Right. right, and you go one way or the other depending on how you're feeling. Right, I mean, you know, sometimes you do like floor plans, and well, you don't really grasp, let's say, the scale of the space you've designed. And once you start putting furniture, and you're like, "Whoa, okay," like I'm like really out there. Right, right, and um, that actually gets to well, let's let's get to this other one first. Uh, the third one is the architectural criteria test, and this is a big one. Oh my! So I think that there's. Like before, we're kind of outlining the difference between these tests and versus being a critic, right? Um, there are different ways that you can critique a piece of architecture. So let's say that there are six main categories, and in each of these categories, you can rate a piece of architecture like you would rate a movie on a scale of one to ten. I was going to say you rate a sandwich. I rate a sandwich from one to ten to paint. Yeah, that's the. Uh, Has anything, the bread? Has anything. the bread? That's the big question. Um, so these are six categories, and it's not to say that these are the ultimate six, that these are the six commandments, but these are roughly the big points, and there's maybe another few that are there. The first is a relationship to site. This is pretty obvious, right? This is something we all should know. Um, this would involve massing access to the site, uh, location of the building, open spaces, and adjacencies. The next is program, the uses and functions of the building, right? The third is the relationship to the local culture and people. Um, the fourth is it's, we're calling it technical integrity, which would include its structural um, kind of performance. And then fifth is sustainability. And then sixth is beauty. And beauty in this case includes form, materials, color, space, all of the stuff that we like to probably focus on more than anything else sometimes. But so let's say you have those six tests and or six categories. And basically, you can approach any building, any project, and be like, okay, here are your six categories. I'm your judge. I'm going to rate you one to ten and whether or not you fulfill these categories. Now, I think that from, from the perspective of a critic, when the project is done, you can critique a project that way. Again, the same way you rate a movie, in a sense. But in terms of process, it's very dangerous to try and think about a project in that way and to try and design a project that way. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. The first is that in the design process, you have to realize that there is hierarchy uh, uh, between everything you're doing with. The information you give, you get when you're doing your research, there's hierarchy within there. You need to figure that out. Um, but there's also hierarchy within these six things. So. You should not think that during the design process that you should place equal importance in all six of these categories, right? And you should not feel like you have to, during the design process, be successful in all of these categories. Like, I need to get a 10 out of 10 out of all these categories by the midterm, by halfway through the design of the project. That's a terrible way to design. It won't work. It's not going to work because these six categories, you have to understand, they are totally indifferent to the story that is your design. And design is storytelling. They're indifferent to that story. And that story, by default, by definition, is going to have hierarchy. It's going to have more important things and less important things. These six categories, which are you know encompassing the the big view, they don't care about any of that stuff. And those categories, like you said, and and 
sometimes you decide what the hierarchy is and some of them sometimes come with the project or the client or the site right that's true and so when you force these six things on the project either you're going to produce something that's incredibly boring and banal it has no direction no soul no story no concept right or you're going to be completely paralyzed and we see this actually a lot with younger designers they get let's say feedback and then they get feedback about all six of these things and they go back to the projects and now they're like okay i gotta try and like answer all of these six different categories halfway through the design process and they become you be they, you, you become completely paralyzed because yeah. it's like almost impossible you know like i was saying also when you force these six categories on yourself on the project you can produce something banal like an example of this would be okay take any speech given by any ceo of any generic corporation when they give a speech right it's incredibly boring dry has no soul it's humanless you know it's been manufactured right why because they have a team of people who have these six categories they're trying to check off all of the boxes check 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 equals good speech no it doesn't it equals a like a decent speech but it's like so boring and not real what and that's why what we said earlier you know comes back at you is that it's not it's not a, a mathematical formula there needs to be some dosing there needs to be some sensitivity to which one is stronger than the other mm -hmm. it needs to be a balance um, i mean if you think about you do speech writing and also story writing if you if your job is to write a story and design is basically you're doing the same exact thing but instead of words you're using formal components physical structures and things um if you try and write a story fulfilling the six you know categories of what makes a good story like i don't think anyone can write a story that way the, the other thing too is that it needs to that's also what makes the project singular mm -hmm. Right? Like if you apply the same six point and the equal hierarchy of all of them on all of your project, right? Well, then it's just like formally it's going to be different, but you know, like everything else is going to be close to the same. And why is this project even here? You know, mm -hmm. why it could be swapped with another one you've done? Right. Exactly. I mean, imagine if, like, as human, we were all equal on the six criterias apply to human human bodies right. right like that would be ultra boring <laughs> that would be ultra boring right. you need mixity and diversity and and different personalities and interests and you know it, it would be ultra boring we'll be living on a tv set or you know in a fake world but. yeah pleasant film right well wow. so so um that's in the design process that does not mean that we are discrediting any of these six categories by the end of the project, right? So um, all of these six categories for, to produce a capital A piece of architecture, a great piece of architecture, should probably address all of these things. One could easily argue. But they should be an address in a way that makes sense for your project not simply to just check off the boxes right so if an easy example that we see very often is someone's in the middle of this yeah oh. sustainability is an easy one to pick on someone's designing a project right and they get criticism okay what about sustainability you didn't address sustainability uh the first question the first response you might have as the designer who does have a story and a concept and a thesis you would say that's clearly not the dirt that's not the point of what i'm creating uh and then you come around to the next uh review the next pinup and suddenly they've solved sustainability with green roofs why do you have green roofs because it solves my sustainable problems or whatever other thing they include in in the in the in the project well you have to solve sustainability in a way that expresses the story of the project, not just to include it in there to tick, tick off the box. Yeah, right? it always pisses me off when I see like, oh, sustainable tower, and it's like all white, and there is like, you know, jungle balconies. I'm like, <laughs> well, first, good luck maintaining that. And also, what a poor way to approach dealing with sustainability for this specific project. Yeah. You know, like you didn't make it your you didn't make it fit the project there's actually been a few of those that have been done fit, i think 
Huh? I think there's been a few towers that have been built oh, like that. Oh, how many? Every time you see a sustainable tower, that's that's the <laughs> first. And the thing is, it's the first response. Like anyone who is not a designer would come up with, well, just put plants on your balcony. Right. Okay, great. That's why we have five-year degree or plus to come up with that, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the sustainable uh, topic is also a difficult one because there are some... You could easily say that some of these things have to be just integrated period no matter what because you know we're running out of what well, it's sustainable it's not just plants that's you know the biggest sure. you know sure, uh, sure. Mis misconception that a lot of designers and, and people have in general you know you can't just i think what you're saying is also you can't just copy and paste stuff into your project and right. then now be like okay problem solved well no i mean again if you're writing a story which you are uh you can't just copy and paste whatever thing into your story to solve the question of to solve the category of i don't know what mystery like it, it doesn't i think it might be better to just say like it's not being treated right instead of you know doing that that's it's, also it's just it's more it's more honest it's more like you know sincere yeah i mean that's the thing too i don't actually really care whether or not a, a piece of architecture or designer solves all of these six things it's more of like, are you honest with yourself about what you're excluding and whether or not it makes sense for them to be excluded? If it makes sense for it to be excluded and you're aware of it, then fine. Like, I have no problem with that. Because it's it's more productive. One could easily argue uh, for capital A architecture and for the development of the designer that it's more productive to produce something that actually has a spine and has a story and a direction that it's clear rather than one that's trying to satisfy everybody yeah. right it's the same thing as trying to satisfy a bunch of people with something that doesn't ever work they just do what makes sense for the project so is there anything else with this test yeah the last thing is that you should not kick out ideas or designs that don't satisfy obviously these six categories like sometimes you can come up with something that maybe only works in one of these ways. And ideally you want something that works in a number of ways, but it could be that that original design just needs to be morphed rather th or reconceived rather than completely rejected. So like, let's say, uh, I don't know, I come up with a shark skeleton idea for my design, right? And I mm -hmm. come up with that because I really like how the, I don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> how the the spine of the shark connects all of the elements together and i think structurally, structurally that could be it yeah right? efficiency right and then one of... structurally actually it's a flop it doesn't work but i realized that the way the light goes through it's incredible the shark skeleton example is very similar to uh like bird skeleton stuff you've seen projects like this right i model my building based on a bird yeah, skeleton like travel stuff right because it's like super structurally efficient and right. therefore it has reason and that justifies the whole building and meanwhile like everyone else is like okay well that's like one out of the six categories i'm pretty sure you need to hit more than one category to have a successful project but in the process of things it could be that the bird skeleton or the shark skeleton which initially was conceived as a way to solve the structural efficiency of things and maybe also had formal, you know, it was beautiful in a sense. Maybe the, that idea, instead of getting completely rejected because it's limited to those two categories, maybe that idea just needs to be reformulated. Because, they, you know, like how do you fit program into a bird skeleton? Like what does that have to do with the culture of people unless they're bird people <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> but so maybe there's a maybe it's just it's instead of just kicking it out entirely there's a way to either modify probably modify your understanding of it in that example more than modify it physically oh it's a step stone toward another right another idea right that's a little more mature so you know it's a balancing act because you we don't want to try and, and satisfy every all the six things even though that's your goal um you just don't want to be become too obsessed with doing that at the detriment of the design process. So it, it, you can't categorically say that, that um, because of course, if you, if you symbol across a design and it is, it hits all the marks, then that's great. But you do have to question, does my project still have a story, mm -hmm. right? And the opposite is if you have a great story, but you're only hitting one or two of the marks, there's probably something not right. So the next test is pro like developing the project, right? Um, the first one is, mm -hmm. what do I do if, I, if I'm stuck? 
Yeah, so th this is actually similar to the abstraction test. So abstraction was about taking that dial and kind of going n not, well, making things blurry. Um, this one, the dial is less to do with blurriness and more to do with just development. So if you're stuck, like one easy way to get unstuck is to just push push forward and ignore the fact that you're stuck. To suspend disbelief and to say like, I know that there are these problems with this. I know, I know that these problems need to be addressed. Um, but instead of just abandoning it, just move forward. Just move forward. Yeah, because sometimes it might just be like it's underdeveloped or you're looking at it ne not necessarily from the right point of view. Yeah. I feel like, right? So disqualifying uh, an idea a little too early, well, you might pass a very good one, you know? And it's the same thing of, um, like, if you imagine you had six different design options in front of you on a table, right? Little physical model things. It's very easy to look at the six and compare and contrast those six, right? This one has their different attributes, but also which one's better or worse for different reasons. You're essentially doing the same thing in this project development test, but you're doing it through time instead of options on the table, mm. sort of. So like, if you could be Dr. Strange and go forward in time and see the future, the amount of insight you would gain to the past or the present would be really valuable. It's the same exact thing. Like a lot of times we're stuck in the design process, but it's just because we need to go forward. And when you yeah. want to advance the thing, you develop it, you actually realize like, oh shit, like either my understanding of this was flawed and it actually is great, or okay, now I have a better understanding of why I was stuck and now I can pivot in a certain way, right? So the development, this new developed version is seen in comparison to the old one, the same as if you had six options on the table right in front of you right now. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah, but you can get lost in the detail because, you know, I mean, I don't know, imagine you have six options you're looking at mm -hmm. and you're moving all of them forward. Like, that could take a tremendous amount of time. So you yeah. got to make the moving forward very quick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, there's you need to have an understanding of constraints, you know, for all of these things. Um, I mean, at some point, you just want to go forward enough to where you're starting to learn about the design, and you're 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 realizing something about it. Past that point, you're probably just sinking time into for nothing. Um, but I think that this way of working is totally valid because if you think about it, even outside of the design process, when when we produce something, there's varying levels of our understanding of that thing that we have. Sometimes I have an idea and I draw what I'm trying to what I'm thinking about and it's a direct expression of that idea Other times I draw the thing and It takes me maybe a few seconds to really understand what I've just created other times It takes me ten minutes other times. It takes me a few days. Sometimes it takes years to understand the thing that you've created so this distance between your own understanding as a designer and the thing that you create means, I think, therefore, it's okay for you to create things that you don't understand. It's okay for you to, to, to develop something that which you know is not good or you believe is not good, right? I think there's a hesitancy sometimes with this particular test because it's like, why would I bother wasting time advancing something when I know it's shit? Well, you might know it's shit, but if you're stuck, this could be very helpful. Well, and, and in the process of developing, you you discover things, and you discover things that could be helpful for the other options. Yeah. You know, or you think about something you have not considered for any of the options. And I think this is also maybe super helpful for people who are perfectionists, which a lot of, a lot of designers are, right? You don't want to produce something that's bad. So if you're at the, I don't know what, schematic design phase, kind of perfect, I want to make the perfect schematic design. Yeah, I can't really do that though, right? You need to move forward to make it perfect. It's the, I think I've talked about this before, but it's the same thing of, uh, this is pretty different, but like music performance, right? If you have a range of like how high and how low that you can you can play, and if like the, the excerpt or the piece that you're playing, the highest note is, a, I don't know, C above the staff or something, right? And you only play within that range. Well, that's not good. You actually want to go past that to give you the flexibility and a better understanding, in this case, skill set to operate within the range of the piece. And it's it's sort of similar to this in a way, right? You you need to go forward and it's and it's not wasted time. Well, and it's almost like, you know, when you're dating someone, well, okay. you don't know, yeah. but I mean, you don't want to commit to spending the life of a person that you don't really know. 
same thing. You don't really want to commit to one of those design options before you actually know like what's inside of them. Yeah. The key is just to turn out that part of the brain that's perfectionist, in, in my case, and be like, let's just move forward. And then, oh, I'm in the future now. Look at this. Isn't this interesting? Now I can go back. Speaking of going back, also with this uh, project development test is the idea of going backwards in time. And I feel like a lot of people and designers are often have problems with going back because going back or like moving back to your parents, you know, anything like going backwards, it's not, it's, it's negative. Mm -hmm. For some reason in our society, it's perceived as like this no, no thing to do. It's totally fine. Like you're designing, there might be things that you've missed or you're stuck and you need to go back to research and, you know, do a little bit more digging there because obviously you missed a step, you missed something. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't forget that the design process is basically just a bunch of tests. You're testing things, which is to say that even though there's a sense of direction, of course, you need to be loose. You need to be okay with going backwards a little bit and going sideways and going here or there and, and looking at things from different perspectives. And, you, I mean, you know, sometimes some, some architects, some designers, they only design one option. Like, you know, they right. have a client's project and they only do one option. Well, they show... Wait, does they design one option or they show one option? They only show one design. Right. You know, I mean, okay, what are the odds the client's going to like it? Mm -hmm. What are the odds this is the best you can come up with? You know, right. like having a range of options allows you comparison and evaluation between them and ultimately growth. Yes, I agree. But is there a difference between showing versus designing? Like a lot of designers will produce a bunch of things, but not show the client, you know, all the options kind of. Well, I That's mean, more of a tactic. There, there is a difference, but at the end showing is the client's going to be the one making the decision, right. right? So if you made the decision of what you think the best option is and you show it to them, well, they might not understand it. You know, if you show them the one you think is best, next to the other two that you've done mm -hmm. that you don't think are as good, it might be clearer for them to understand it. And I think oftentimes, you know, offices kind of underestimate the use of options because you actually, there is an order in which you show your options, right? If you want one option to be selected versus another. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and for someone who's completely out of the process, they don't know, they don't know all the things you've been considering and explored. So at least showing them a range. Well, this also reminds me of, this is actually not really related, but it reminds me of that there's another kind of way of working. It's not a test per se, but it's a way of working where if you're stuck, you just produce a bunch of options, like the shotgun approach. All right. So you have design charrettes, you design charrettes, right? This, yeah. um, this search for conceptual clarity where you're trying to make some um, the murky image become clearer is there, but also you can't allow yourself to be stuck in that one train, right? Sometimes you just blow it up and, and spew out a bunch of options just to, just to get loose and to see things again, as you said, like within that greater context, right? But in terms of going backwards, I think the reason why it's difficult is that you it requires the designer to acknowledge that they've fucked up and that they've made a mistake and that what they've produced not only is what they produce not good but in order to fix it, they have to go backwards and there's a sense of like lost progress well there is a sense of failure like you failed yeah, yeah. you know and that's not a taste that a lot of people <laughs> are okay yeah. with having I think it's you also know? parallel to like why we stay working in, in one medium, in one computer or sketching, because I haven't made it work. It's not good yet. Well, I'm going to fucking make it good. Keep going and going and going. Well, no, no, just shift, 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 shift. So uh, the going backwards thing, I think there's a lot of examples for that. And even when we had our conversation with um, the architect and Fusion on this podcast, it was actually something that she remarked was both the computer example and also the going backwards, that when they're stuck in their office and this happens for pretty much all the, all, all the designers I've ever spoken with, there's something about the previous step that they did incorrectly or they missed. And that's the key. And even with like working with students, it's most of the time it's like, yeah, let's go back a few steps and look at what you did here because that set you on the wrong trajectory, right? And that's also, the, the going backwards is just super important. It applies to everything, even when you're talking to a client. Like, but yeah, but why do you want to do this, right? What is the motivation? What is the underlying reason? 
But and I think it has to do with honesty too. Like you have to admit to yourself if you know that something is not right or you've missed a step or you need to go back. And I think by going backwards, you can either incorporate. It's not just getting. It's not just breaking loose and and all the kind of like fear related issues, but it could be that you just need to incorporate more ingredients into the thing you're working with. And a lot of times when a design becomes stale and stagnant, it's like. Either you can try to re-understand that thing and reformulate that thing, but sometimes you need to inject more information into it, right? Bring in more ingredients from the research to 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 shape, to change the equation that you're dealing with at that moment in time. And it's similar to like, or develop it further, right? Bring more stuff into it. As you said before, like in a floor plan example, like, is this floor plan good? Okay, well, let's see. Let's put furniture in it. Let's say detail it out. Let's look at the look at the elevations and whatever else to see if this actually works. You can't stare at a floor plan and assume it's going to work out. And and just by working in that phase before before developing it further, it doesn't it's, it doesn't work that way. So the forward back idea I think is important. All right, moving along here, we have two more. The next one is conceptual clarity. Perhaps the most elusive and confusing of the tests. Conceptual clarity? Yeah, sequence. Conceptual sequence test. Oh. Um, design, as I said before, is problem solving. But really, it's more of actually searching for the true problem that you're dealing with. The actual question. Finding the real question. And interestingly... When you find what that question is, the solution comes with it. The solution becomes really obvious. So again, the focus is on questions and not on solutions. When we focus on solutions, they tend to be baseless, boring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you focus on the questions, <laughs> it can sometimes again feel like a waste of time because it's not producing a solution. But when you ask the right question, the solution is there with it yeah so you yeah, you have to go back to the concept recording because the key is to have the best solution is you have to find the best question and the second part of this is that there are different layers to the question of why so you produce something why is it good you answer that why is that answer correct and why is that correct and you, and you keep going further and further and further down and this creates a sequence of why statements Okay, a sequence of why statements. Now, eventually those why statements lead to a how and then to the what, which is the building. But these why statements, they need to have, well, should I get an example? Is that an easier thing? Easier sure, way to yeah. Okay. Okay, so here's an example from a project. Uh, this was typed quickly, but I think it serves our purposes. So at the core, the core why statement that any designer we should all have in common is like, you know, why are you doing this? Because we want to help people. We want to make the world a better place. That if you don't have that, then you probably belong in prison. But let's start there. So why does this project exist? Why am I doing this project? Why? Because I want to help people. Why? Because I believe that people are not as happy and as satisfied as they could be because people within the city context, living in cities, are too detached from the physical environment and there's a displacement between their experiences their, their their experiences now life their life now is fragmented why is this because there's a separation between digital life via social media and these kinds of things versus the physical experiences that we have in the city why does this separation exist one reason is that the physical environment of the contemporary city um, does not allow co-authorship whereas these digital interfaces and these digital experiences allow a high degree of what feels like a lot of authorship and expediency, whereas the physical environment does not. And this in turn allows our total experience to be fragmented. Why is it that the built environment is this way? In the case of uh, this particular project, which was located in Manhattan, a gridded city, we would say it's because the built environment is monotonous and our movements within the city is monotonous because the urban framework is a fixed and rigid grid. Um, and also because we have sacrificed cities to the automobile. Why is this? 
a problem because the automobile was not designed for the city because the automobile is too large polluting fast dangerous and why have we allowed all this because we prioritize efficiency and speed over quality and experience so that lineage that 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 train of thought you know you could kind of decipher or nitpick on specific things but it should be that each of those statements directly feed into the next right so it's a yeah yeah that's how you test how strong your why is how strong your why is it and it's a pretty big so first it's a pretty big leap to go from i want to help people well that's pretty that's too that's too vague that's too broad right it's a big leap to go from that to now critiquing cities and the implementation of the automobile right but the steps to get there should be pretty clear they should make sense there should not be a step where like as a listener you're thinking well that's a huge assumption right there's a certain direction to it given the focuses of that particular project but none of them are giant leaps yeah and the, and the, the you can be broad at the very beginning like i want to help people but if that's the case you got to like you said keep moving the question the why 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 until you get to something that's substantial right in the same time you can be too specific let's say you do want to do the shark skeleton right mm -hmm. because then you have to go backward in the why and find and, and you know they might lead you up to like two whys before the shark skeleton response and that's it yeah so yeah, yeah. It, you know like you you cannot start with the the last why you have to it, it's a, it's a, it, like you say, it's, it's a sequence. It's a sequence, and you need to develop the sequence. So part of the design process is trying to develop that sequence. The In the process, though, of designing, you will start somewhere on that spectrum. You don't know where exactly, right? You'll start somewhere. And then your job is to find out where on that, in that lineage, in that sequence you are. If you're too specific or too vague or somewhere in the middle, and if you're somewhere in the middle, you need to develop in both directions kind of thing. And as you said, when when projects, when people present projects and they're like, yeah, why did you do this? And they say, because I believe that, you know, community and friendship amongst people are good. It's like, yeah, that's not that. It's that, like you can't develop a project based on your first why. It that doesn't, <laughs> that, that there's too much of, there's too much of a big leap between that yeah. and, and whatever the project is. And so like because ultimately the developing the sequence is helping you developing your argument to why your project is yeah unbeatable yes yeah 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 it should also be that when you go down this path you know why this because 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 you end up in a place that's actually quite different from the very beginning because it's much more detailed um so it's a, in, in a way it's, it's a bit of a surprise but also somehow having gone through the journey it makes sense because the space between each of those sentences and arguments right is super tight and as a result of that that leads neatly into the how and the how in terms of an architecture project would be considered the program and let's say the part t or the 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 overall big gesture form right so like the project that I was outlining was a project of mine, and I had an interest in, obviously, an interest in city design, urban design, and there was also this interest in like how digital technologies are impacting how we think. Hence, the other paper that I wrote, the In Between State. So, so I think I think in the sentences that I gave, you can see where they, they pivot, right? Jumping from that people are are not as happy and as satisfied, jumping from that to because our experiences are divided, we live divided lives between physical and digital. Like that's a different that's a specific direction, but it's also an easy argument to prove based on a lot of research and things like this. But what's interesting is that even though you start at that point with this 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 statement that the we have this split between experiences that ends up leading to a direct critique of the of the city form itself the fact that it is a perfect cartesian grid nearly and that produces a certain kind of mindset and a movement right and then now suddenly we're speculating in this project how do you reformulate the grid of manhattan so that it becomes so that produces opposite effects of what i've already talked about so that's what I'm saying, like the why leads to the how and the what very clearly if you do it correctly, right? Because it's really obvious now where I'm at and the pro after, after I said all of that, it's like, okay, well, obviously there's some changes that need to happen and I know the direction because it's going to do 
is going to fix is going to be the opposite of what I just outlined kind of thing. I will say though that that paragraph of text that I read off one was done quickly, but two, uh, you know, that's me writing about a project after it's been done for a number of years. Yeah, that's not necessarily something that you're going to come up at the beginning of the design process and like bingo, I know which direction to go. Like it might be something you're going to undiscover as you move through the design process or even sometimes after the design has been designed, you mm -hmm. know. But questioning the why is always a good way to move the cursor further and being more pertinent in the solution that you end up with. Yeah. And, and at the very least, have an understanding of where you are. You know, I, I, I think the the danger is that for the more conceptual thinkers out there, um, that you get stuck with something like this, and it becomes like your priority. And again, you, you don't want to produce something that doesn't have this thinking behind it. But especially for young designers and for projects with, with very fast deadlines, you, you, you know, you might not be able to do it all in time. Um, and, and that's, again, more for the people who don't produce things on time. So a concept, a concept is an approach that solves more or less all of the things in that why sequence that I, I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Having an approach which addresses all of the why statements consistently. The concept for the project that I talked about with the Manhattan Grid and whatever was fluidity and improvisation. Those two ideas basically addressed all the issues that I had come across and were the spine that were the big ideas behind all the solutions I proposed, right? And I, I would call it a concept again because it applies throughout. It's not just a superficial thing that applies to one part of the project. Right. It applies throughout all the all the thinking. So if you have a project in the end that does not is not expressive of a clear why sequence, the project is probably not as valid as it needs to be. And the reason why also I think that writing these things down is important is because it's another way of the writing itself is another way of testing another medium, right? Of testing the project. It tends to be that in our profession, because the final product is a physical, formal, material, whatever thing. We focus only on that, but that realm of language, that language allows us, allow, is open to a lot of interpretation and allows us to effectively bullshit our way through the argument. It's easy to lie when the language is formal. It's impossible to lie when the language is written language, English or French or whatever, right? So that is also why a really important, uh, another factor, another reason for having these why statements. It's it's forcing you to explain things in the ultimate test in a clear way. And if you can't do it, there's probably something wrong with the form of the building. I, unless, of course, you're just underdeveloped in, in terms of writing and thinking in that sense. I mean, the last test, which is probably the most unexpected one, is that um, the solution should excite you. Like, if you're bored by the design you're proposing, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's not why you're dedicating your whole life to architecture. Like, how sad is that? Designing things that don't make you happy and want to do more and want to get out of bed in the morning and jump on the board, you know, like, no, it has to be, it has to be exciting. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the point if it's not exciting you, man? Stimulate. I, I think also, I like this test because it's easy. Because you know if it's something that excites you, it's, just, it's, it's a feeling. But again, that feeling comes from specific reasons, right? Something excites you when it's it's new to you. I don't right. really care if it's new to the world. Don't don't try and reinvent everything every time and make something new. It's too much pressure. But if it's new to you, that means something because it's not so much that you've not seen or heard of this thing before or that you've not seen something similar. The excitement should come from the fact that whatever preconceptions you had at the beginning, which we all do, that there's a big difference between those preconceptions and where you ended up. That's the excitement, right? You're excited because you're like, you know, this is not what something. I expected yeah. it to be at the beginning. Not that it's different from other things you've seen, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a different situation. Well, it's more of a personal, a personal excitement yeah. too, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you, 
you've put the effort and you know like you felt like you've accomplished something you've learned something you challenge yourself you know it's 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 an excitement about the project but it's also an excitement about your own achievement which i think that's why it's very it's very dangerous to just stick to a design process mm. repeatedly because ultimately it's going to make you a sad designer and it's <laughs> going to make your project sad. We're not really a designer anymore, right? Because you're not you questioning. Know, like you, it's you, the you're, machine. You're relying on this framework as a place of security. Yeah. Again, going back to this issue of wanting security. I believe that you should learn from the thing you create. So this is kind of weird because like I think we assume that learning requires that I go out into the world, right? And I'm getting information from some other thing, from a lecturer, from a YouTuber, from a podcaster, from a book, from a course, right? That's how I learn. But I think a lot of learning can happen just at your desk. Obviously you're pulling information from different places for the research portion of the design process, but the designing of the thing itself is a learning process like you were like the thing you've created it should teach you something and that's a weird emotion to have it's a weird feeling to have when you're sitting there and you're looking at this object that you created and yet you're like oh it's kind of i'm, I'm, I'm learning actively learning from it so the final building for me it, it should it has to be something that you yourself are learning from when you look at it. And it has to make you question. If you produce the thing and it's not making you question and you don't feel like you've learned f or are or, or actively learning from looking at this thing, you probably didn't push hard enough. Yeah, agreed. You know. Agreed, it should hurt a little bit. It should hurt, yeah. You no, know, yeah, you're right though. I mean, there's a, there's this kind of like fine line, this threshold, right? Uh, in terms of like effort in a way. And if you don't push enough to that edge then either the thing you produce is not as good as it needs to be for other people and for sure it's not as good as it could have been for yourself well it's like a workout right like you the next day you're not sore didn't work out hard enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? it should be painful you know and if, if the next day well you can't you can't you can stand up well that's good that means that you know you've challenged yourself you Put yourself in and, you know, you, you push your limits and, and you've learned something and you're making progress. And if you can't get out of bed, it means you went too hard. You, well, right? yeah. If you didn't complete the project, you probably... You, yeah. You, yeah, you probably... <laughs> you, just, no, not good. You put no. too much effort in one place or not at all. I'm one of those two. So, yeah, the design process, it's... it's uh, There's only a, a process in terms of moving forward because of, of the fact that you are moving forward and you're completing something. But this, I think it's critical for designers to be light to feel like you're loose you know and be open to different things and then run use these different filters or these tests as we call it yeah i mean the design process should be exploratory you know like you you only have to put things down on paper for good when when that's it like that's the final round or you know that's the construction drawings or but other than that yeah you should you should stay flexible anything else with the design process do you want to talk about I mean, there is many more things that I'm sure we could talk about, but I think that's, uh, that covers a lot, probably, right? Yes. It, oh, quickly, we do have that one question. I think we've already answered it, maybe. But for that, per that person? The listener said, uh, Hi again. In one of your podcasts, you mentioned that a good design concept is one that has political, formal, and social impact. I'm struggling to understand the link between this and the concept driver or party statements and diagrams. How would you suggest to wrap it all up together in a clear and coherent at the start of the project? Okay, right. So uh, uh, a party diagram is a, is a drawing typically or a model, but it's a formal thing that expresses the main big gesture of the building, the big formal gesture of the building. Um, um, or the main but I, I don't want to use the form. I don't want to use the term formal to to, to suggest that that that. Um, well, it's an, it's abstract. Yeah, it's abstract. It's a, it's a gesture. Right. It's a, it's it's a ge yeah, correct. Um, the the statement that it goes along with that you would consider to be like your design intent statement or something like this. And in terms of what a concept is, I believe I we further clarified in this recording again. It's the it's the abstract idea that solves and it gets used and and to solve 
a number of different issues that you come across in the project uh, through the why statement uh, statement sequence, as I mentioned, and also its relationship to it should get applied to the social, political, and formal uh, parts of the project as well. So, in terms of like a hierarchy, I guess we could we could say in a way, there's research, there's then concept, then design intent, uh, which might come might actually come before the concept. And then there's the formal realization, which begins with the party diagrams. And then that obviously has to become not an abstract uh, drawing, let's say, and become a building at some point. So that's the hierarchy. And the political and social, that, that you know, it's, it's underlined somewhere in the project. It yeah. doesn't mean like it's a separate thing you have to figure out at the beginning or like on the scale of hierarchy out of the six points that you mentioned that they're top two. Six know. points? Well, yeah, like the sites, the, the oh, architecture. The category, yeah. yeah, the right. architecture points. The commandments, yeah. So look, I, I think for this particular individual, I, I if I recall, they're on the younger side. So, you know, in these recordings, we outline like maximum, like this is the big, big, big scope. And again, I think it's more productive to just focus on making the project good for what it's trying to do. And it tends to be, and even for built works, that uh, that might mean limiting scope and understanding to only, uh, let's say in this case, a few of the six categories that we mentioned before, right? But the awareness of all of them has to be there. Um, so you have to understand also that, let's say, if in your career you're going to do a total of 50 projects, you're going to design 50 projects, that it's a mis that that it's a mistake to place the same pressures on the first one as you would on the 25th project, okay? Um, because I think the reason why I mention all this is because there's a danger of paralysis with all of these things, um, right? Which is again why having the story is the most important thing before any of this other stuff. Yep. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you, you can't wrap it all together at the beginning. It's not possible. And it, it shouldn't be. If you if you have it figured out at the beginning, then you've done something wrong. <laughs> like maybe about halfway, that's when things become really, really clear. Anything else? Nope. If you enjoy this recording or you found it helpful, then please support the show by leaving a review where? On iTunes, I believe. It's the only place. Yeah. Uh, most of our episodes and interviews are on YouTube, so you can also leave us a comment there and subscribe to the channel. We are also on all of the social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we have a hotline where you can text or call, leave us a question, send us some guest suggestions. We actually got a few recently, so thank you guys for sending those. Or anything you want us to talk about, any topics, any building you want us to maybe review, you know, things like that. All right. The number is 213-222-6950. Yep. That's right. Anything else? I think that's that, I think that's all of it. Happy New Year. Happy New Year and we will talk to you again next week or sooner. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.